Okay, so we seems to have some issues once again with the live. So I'm sorry everyone who has joined us already, but let's give it a second go. Um, so once again, here is Circle Economy Club London, Katerina here, and I'm hoping to connect with Claire Potter, who I introduced earlier. Um, so fingers crossed it's going to work this time. It's so unpredictable. Um, thank you guys for coming back and thank you, Claire, for joining again. So, let it go. Okay, yes, okay. Hey. <laughs> Hi, let's, fingers crossed, it's going to work this time. <laughs> fingers crossed. <laughs> no, no matter how much we plan this, it's just technology. But hey, um, we are live, so this is um, the... the the curse of life, but it's also exciting. <laughs> but I can hear you and see you. So, so far, so good. Fabulous. Me too. Lovely Great. to see you. Uh, so uh, I was just saying earlier in the first video, which got deleted, um, unfortunately, that um, you are based in Brighton. And in a very basic terms, which is so much more, of course, um, you are one of the sustainable uh, experts and, and leaders around circular economy. And you have your studio based in Brighton as well, I believe. Yeah. And um, so there is a couple of themes that we want to unpack with you today. Um, and I guess I would like to start from the beginning. Um, so what made you focus on more sustainable design and the circularity? Because it seems like you, you, you started back in 2008 with your practice. And I believe it must have started back in school. So I would love to know, because I'm a lecturer myself and I deal with students and uh, within fashion and it's interesting, you know, it was it something that inspired you or something you came across? What kind of triggered the way you're going to go around design and, and circularity? Sure. So um, I grew up in Brighton, so I'm still based in Brighton. Um, and when I was a kid, I wanted to be a marine biologist. So that was my love. I had the love of the ocean. I spent all of my weekends down on the seafront doing, uh, picking up stuff from the strand line, um, learning about the ocean. And that's what I wanted to do. I wanted to specialize in shark behavior and try and wow. help people realize that sharks weren't the nasty things that you saw in Jaws, for example. So that was the thing that I wanted to do. Um, and to cut the very long story of my childhood very short, it was always a toss up between biology and something around ecology. But then also I was really interested in arts and music. So at one point I was actually going to go and do film composition uh, at, at university. And I, I, I ended up doing A-levels in double music and double art. So it was always a toss up between those. But I still had this love of, uh, of nature uh, and sort of ecology from that point. And back as a kid, I, I made like T-shirts as fundraisers for Greenpeace and World Wildlife Fund. And uh, when we had the live animal exports down in Brighton of the um, for fee for um, uh, for like beef cattle and, and sheep and stuff. And mm -hmm. I was down there with my bandana on protesting and throwing um, throwing balloons at the police with red, red paint and stuff. So I was always interested. <laughs> <laughs> I, was, I was always really interested in trying to to make the world better in some way, but very much from that sort of ecology basis. And so they ended up going to university. I did interior architecture in the end, just sort of the music went to one side. Mm -hmm. And what was great, I, again, I studied at University of Brighton and we had quite a good free reign to figure out exactly what we wanted to do. It could be quite conceptual with what we wanted to do. Mm -hmm. um, and we had a couple of brilliant lecturers, uh, one of which was Duncan Baker Brown from BBM Architects, who came in and was explaining to us about sustainable architecture and the fact that if you're building something that in theory should be around for a really long time, building should <laughs> be here forever. Um, you have got a responsibility to make it the best it could possibly be. And the things aren't mutually exclusive. You know, if you're doing design, if you're doing building, you don't have to be an architect or a designer and then an ecologist. They could sort of be the same thing. So right back from university, I was thinking how I, anything that I was creating could be done using reusable materials, recycled materials, could be dismantled, could utilize something that had a previous life. So that's what we now know as circularity. But back then it was just ecological design, green design, sustainable design. Um, just questioning then, everything, yeah. Yeah, basically. Um, and uh, then I went, I finished university, I ended up living in the Alps for a little bit, came back. And I was, again, I was really lucky to work at an architect that had a very similar ethos. So. I came in as like really fresh faced, really enthusiastic young uh, interior architect. And 
I say, you know, can we do this? Can we use that material? I found this exciting thing. And if we could fit it in the budget and the client went for it, then yeah, I was allowed to do it. So they were instrumental in sort of helping me figure out how I could take this passion and then put it into a, into a professional and industrial setting. And then I eventually set up my own studio in 2008. And mm-hmm. the decision was then to uh, only focus on stuff that would do good because all the way back at university, it was sort of sort of shown to us, why do something really crap when you could do something really good? So yeah. that's a decision that we have to make. And sometimes you're restricted through budget, through planning, through what your client wants. But the most good you can do, the better. So that's the ethos that the studio was founded on um, and has mm-hmm. now become entrenched in circular design. Okay, great uh, introduction to that. But I just have one more question because that's really interesting. That So before your own practice, so before 2008, how did you find it? Were the clients open to more sustainable materials, uh, more circularity already there? That If you convinced them, how was the reaction then? So back then, people would come with a project and they would say, so this is the project, this is the budget. So we then go back and say, this is our proposal based on the budget and what you want to do. Some people would say, um, we don't mind as long as it fits within the budget. So then I could go, OK, look, we can cut back on stuff here, which means we can spend more money on a recycled plastic, for example. Mm-hmm. Mm-hmm. Or we could increase the U value of the windows we were using, which is better thermal efficiency. And you could say you spend a little bit more money now, but then you're going to get the, the payback over a certain amount of years. So it was always a question of say, you're paying here, but you're going to get it back or we can save money here, but then we'll have this. Um, So it was a lot of work and particularly using reused materials, recycled materials and having to source stuff rather than just going to a catalogue and getting it straight out and deliver the next day. So so we had to sort of suck up the time Mm -hmm. that it took to actually do that. Um, But a lot of clients were really receptive, particularly when I explained why we weren't doing something. Mm -hmm. So, for example, like UPVC windows. Um, I was like, we're not going to be specifying that because, and if they were really hard nosed and said, we definitely want them, then at the early days, I'd say, okay, fine, but this is the reason why we wouldn't usually. And then as the years went on, all the clients became very self selecting. So people would come to the studio saying, we know that you know what you're talking about with this, and we were really inspired by this that you did, and how can you help mm-hmm. us to be better? Which was brilliant because it meant that you didn't have to have so many of those initial conversations because yeah. people were already coming to you and yeah. saying, but it just shows, me. yeah. It just shows that you know when you put the work in, that actually stays embedded within the clients. So again, it's the, the sustainable thinking. You know, it it pays off long term, and not everybody gets converted. I can imagine, but already, you know, going back some time, you know, that yeah. there was uh, that's it's it's really about the conversation and, and you know doing the initial groundwork. Um, so yeah, I, no, I believe in that because cutting corners obviously it, it's not going to help anybody and long term it will show. You know, yeah. But exactly. within the architecture and the interior space, I think it's that you know that's it should be, uh, you know, absolutely necessary to to not even like think about short term. You know, so I yeah. guess that's a space that um, it should set the standards really. So. Um, it's exciting to hear that, you know, um, that you were able to work with people like that and, and change their minds already. And so then coming to your studio, uh, 2008, um, I imagine it must have been one of the first places uh, around, around thinking about sustainability and circularity. Am I wrong? How did you there, find that place? There was a few of us. So oh. actually um, down in Brighton, we're really lucky. We live in a bubble, as we call it. So you, you tend to get quite a lot of like-minded people collect together. And in this area, we had uh, me. There was lots of other practices that didn't maybe um, – say that they were sustainable but it was entrenched in what they did so like the previous Mm -hmm. architects i was working at they would try to do things as as you know sustainable as possible but there was a few of us that actually were sort of putting ourselves forward as doing that um back in 2008 which was lovely and what has become we've all become we're all really great friends which is brilliant and sometimes if one person doesn't have the time or a project's not quite right for them they'll go I can't do it, but then I can pass you on to somebody else. And then we sort of like help and shift each other, which has been brilliant. So we've got Oliver Heath, who works in Brighton as well. So you've got Duncan Baker Brown, who's just outside of Brighton. And all of us have got a really lovely connection with, with, with one another, even from all of those, all the way back in those days. So it's been, um, it's been fantastic. It's been really community, good. Community, yeah. Support. Yeah, yeah. of course, that helps uh, enormously. And, and so... Since 2008, I mean, I imagine that uh, it's been a lot of projects and a lot of uh, practice-based um, solutions as well. 
what could you maybe highlight you know the biggest shift that you've seen or one of the projects that really changed something for you or for the client in terms of circularity sure um well we did quite a variety of projects from doing landscapes and quite conceptual stuff all the way through to sort of interior projects and when i first started off it was very much doing about interior architecture then landscapes started to creep in because people say you know it happened to be like well you've got that view so you could do that and people go oh do you understand mm-hmm. landscape i was like yeah because i had a background of learning how to grow stuff so mm-hmm. i had a very good knowledge particularly of edible spaces so that ended up becoming part of the practice work so then um, we were doing outdoor spaces as well so everything has shifted over the years um but what is one of the biggest projects that we did which was a massive shift was the hisby um project in brighton which was a supermarket an independent supermarket hisby standing for how it should be um and it was uh, amy and ruth and they basically were based in brighton i don't know how we connected i think it was through twitter or something really random <laughs> um anyway we ended up doing working together to actually create the space with them and they were they had a very 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 limited budget and time scale but they were fully open to all of the ideas so when i came along and said this quite this amazing plastic that's made from recycled yogurt pots so it fits within the idea of food waste like food like packaging mm-hmm. waste um, and can we fit that in and they were like yep yeah, as long as it's uh, if it's within the budget let's go for it so then and we were sort of really worked around how the store could work and how it could look like a supermarket and yeah. feel like a supermarket but works slightly differently um so then you're getting into consumer psychology then you're getting into understanding how people shop and behavior patterns um how people feel comfortable in a space without it feeling too alien to them and as much as we again we're lucky and bright we've got places like infinity foods which have been in the north lane area forever since i was you know back in the 70s i think but some people feel that it's a health food store and we can't go in because we don't know what you know there's all it's all yeah. mung beans and weird things we've never heard yeah. before so that it was trying to understand how do you encourage people to use a place that has got different things mm-hmm. um particularly lots of vegan things as well which you know in brighton again we've got a great population of uh, vegans and vegetarians and flexitarians etc but it was understanding the psychology of people more uh, and then that started to branch out to a lot of our other projects and working more with community projects we worked with brighton host food partners to create a community kitchen to teach people how to cook so people can come together and learn how to use stuff uh, how to feed themselves how to you know do all this stuff that is really important to be a sustainable individual so all of the stuff that started and community then, yeah mm. exactly and community building which is really really key for this you know you could ne- you should never feel like you're in a bubble trying to hit your head against a brick you know brick wall yeah. trying to do the best thing so building community is something that has really expanded into our work far more over the last sort of five six years interesting um and it feels like it's really brighton is thriving and we have so much to learn from you guys <laughs> over there uh, hence the conversation and of course you have the the water um uh, the sea yeah. uh, and obviously uh the issues um, um connected to that um so i want to jump on that a little bit because i know like in your practice especially some of your beautiful interior pieces and and products uh, product design uh you've been using recycled plastic um so i would love to know how it all started and um and obviously the love of sea and nature uh, uh that you see every day i guess and uh seeing obviously the, the uh, impact of plastic that is coming to the shores um so how did you get to kind of do it as a as a part of your practice mm-hmm. um what sort of um started or triggered that um that moment like yeah let's make it into something um uh, that we could sell or into a product that could be feasible what yeah. was the kind of trigger point It was really interesting because um so once to be marine biologist when I was a kid mm. I spent a lot of time on the seafront and even though you'd see rubbish and bits and pieces on the seafront when I was small you didn't see anywhere near the volume of plastic mm. that we now see so again mm. I've seen how it's grown immensely um over my adult life so it was I think I was on the beach and I was picking up bits and pieces of um fishing rope and fishing gear uh, and just just generally just doing cleanups uh, and then I sort of realized that this is a waste problem but it's a behavior problem it's an infrastructure problem it's a product problem and a material problem and actually plastic isn't the enemy we use it in a very very bad way so we use it in a throwaway um as a throwaway material we shouldn't do uh, but it has a huge amount of benefits so it was an interesting sort of junction between thinking this is where my sustainable you know marine biology ecology 
emphasis then is clashing with the stuff that I do, understanding materials and design. And how can we make people value materials more, but understand mm. the implications of those materials? So uh, at the same sort of time, I contacted the World Citation Alliance, which is based in Brighton, their headquarters. And they were looking for designers and artists to build something to educate people about ghost gear, which is abandoned, lost or discarded fishing gear. Mm-hmm. It gets washed up all over the all of the um, uh, the world, and it travels, and it has a huge amount of impact. Not only is entanglement, but for things eating it and then breaking down into small pieces. But not a lot of people really understood where it was coming from, uh, as as far as the public goes. So we created a, a chandelier which was um, clear bubbles that were filled with the plastic. We showed at the Clark and World Design Festival, um, and the bubbles were arranged in such a way like a chandelier. Um, to mimic the idea of the humpback whale. So some humpback whales actually do something called bubble net feeding, where they swim around a shoal of fish blowing bubbles, which confuses the fish. Oh. And then, so you have the bubble uh, blower uh, whale and all of the others sit underneath. And then once the bubble net is surrounding the fish, they all swoop up from underneath to eat the fish. So it's a collaborative way of working. <laughs> so it was, it was brilliant. But then of course they're ingesting everything. It's not just the fish, it's anything that's sort of floating around. So this was the metaphor for the plastic bubbles that were filled mm. with the plastic. And what I love about doing work like that is you're showing something beautiful, but you're educating people because you yes. can sort of entice them in with, you know, and they're like, oh, this, this looks incredible. Can I take a photo? Yeah, of course. Do you know what it's about? Mm. No, please tell me. And then you've got that sort of really lovely conversation. It's not um, sometimes eco design in inverted commas can be so worthy that it turns people off. So you have to be able to draw people in with some kind of aesthetic or something that makes them interested. And then it's sort of like a, it's sort of like a backdoor way of educating people. <laughs> it's a bit yeah, sort of, yeah. <laughs> of course, it, it has to be well. that balance that you know, it's visually enticing, uh, but it's the right kind of um, story with this as well because um i mean i work in the space of fashion and it's also you know sustainability is such an overused word and it's becoming sort of negative almost you know and sort of oh not again we don't want to hear this so finding um a story and a representation visual or or 3d representation and um, i saw the images that were so beautiful um so i can only imagine that you know how it can tell a story and get people interested and uh, did it create some some kind of impact long term? This um, this exhibition and this collaboration. Yeah. So um, with the World Station Lights, it was done as a, um, so it was going to be a rolling exhibition that was traveling around in lots of different places, and it did get shown in a few places, mm-hmm. which is great. It's currently in storage at the moment, looking for like a long term home. But it meant that we became more um, involved in the World Station Alliance, and I was actually invited to be part of the Global Ghost Gear Initiative, which is a global. Um, sector of anything from government all the way through to small NGOs and we all come together to share our global knowledge about ghost gear so I was the World Citation Alliance representative um, all the Mm -hmm. way back then because they didn't have a huge amount of time it meant that I could come in and sort of disseminate my knowledge of sort of ghost gear from a design and end of life perspective and then talking to people maybe in Canada who have a huge amount of nets but don't know what to do with them so there was this Mm -hmm. like crossover and again this collaboration of knowledge across the world um, now I'm the um, working group coordinator at the Global Ghost Gear Initiative for the Replicating Solutions Group. So it means that I actually, um, with the chair, um, who's based out of Alaska, uh, it means that we actually coordinate that group and, and Triple GI has grown massively. So we do everything for, and it's all volunteer role. It's all done in sort of spare time. Yeah, um, but it's absolutely incredible, um, the work that Triple GI is doing. So oh, yeah. that's become a real legacy from just doing like one small thing. No, that's amazing. And, you know, it it's makes such a difference. I can make a change like that on such a scale. I'm just curious, actually. So would you know what what is made out of all the fishing nets? Like what is the main um, recycling purpose? So mm-hmm. fishing nets, um, the really complicated thing about, oh, literally, we could, I could nerd out for like an hour about nets, but I won't. Um, so fishing nets, depending on where you're in the world, it depends on what it's made from because it depends what it's going to fish for. Yeah. But you generally have, um, it's all plastic based. That's the main thing. It used to be made from rope, natural fibers, but of course that degraded quickly and the strength went and fishers sort of want the trust of the synthetic material. So you can understand why it's used. Yeah. But generally you have things like polyethylene, polypropylene and nylon. 
So nylon is the thing that we see recycled the most because it's relatively easy to depolymerize, mm. break it up, repolymerize, build it back together and turn it into new stuff. So there's companies that make um, swimwear, so Econile um, make fibers that you can actually just spun nylon that you get swimsuits from and clothing. Um, a company, oh, this is my favorite prop in the world. So there's also a company called Boreo and they make things like sunglasses. So this is all nylon six. So this is, um, in theory, if this breaks, I could bust it up and send it back to Boreo. It could be chipped up and turn into new stuff. They make skateboards as well. Um, so there's quite a variety of things that made. Some people are also making socks out of the eco nile or some kind of fiber. But we, what's interesting when you're using fishing gear as a material to build new stuff is that my Boreo sunglasses is just nylon six. Um, but as soon as you're wrapping a natural fiber around a core of a synthetic fiber in circular economy terms, it means that you've sort of created something you can't do anything with. Yeah. Mm -hmm. So that can be turned into new sunglasses, but my socks can't be turned into anything really. Yeah. So this is the re it's great that it's being used and we have so much fishing net as a raw material. It's insane. It makes up. So the great Pacific garbage patch, the huge floating Island of, of, of exactly. yeah. Yeah. So it's, it's approximately 46 to 50% volume of fishing gear. This course nets are huge. Mm. They're hundreds and hundreds of meters long. They get wound up with everything. Then you've got the floats, you've got everything else. So they're big and they're bulky. So we've got a lot of this material that is causing massive damage. If we can turn it into cool, sexy stuff like this, that lasts a really long time. People are going to buy it yeah. and they're going to use it. And honestly, I, these have fallen off my head so many times and not busted, touch wood. So <laughs> they last a long time, which is really what we want from circular economy products. Yeah, I mean, th this is the problem within fashion and the fibers when there's so many blended of them. Um, so it, it, we are waiting for some of the startups to find the solutions to break down blended fibers. So that's why I'm, I'm slightly jealous that I'm working in the interior and architectural space where you can use uh, materials in a more solid way and, and yeah. in kind of these blocks. So I guess uh, that's my next question for you that as you mentioned that you're working on different projects like with a supermarket and recycling specific plastics, uh, for example, from yogurt pods. Um, where do you find your materials and, and how do you recycle them in order to bring it to the project for the clients? Has it gone easier as well over the last years uh, to access them? Oh, I'm sorry. sorry. <laughs> it's right. I'm surprised we don't have signs down here. I'm right near my road. It's really loud. Um, so yeah, so the materials that we use have, have varied quite a lot. So the practice, uh, our practice just generally uses fishing gear because that's okay. sort of become my real nerd specialism mm -hmm. of which we can access a lot of. Um, that is something that just wasn't around. People weren't even thinking about recycling fishing gear until maybe five years ago. I can't remember exactly when Boreo started, but um, it's quite a pure material. That's a good thing about it. And the trouble with recycle it is that you need to get it a certain level of purity for you to be able to do stuff with it. Mm -hmm. um, in the studio, we've got a really small injection molder. So that's where we did a research project that was funded by um, Innovate UK. And we've been told it was the first ever marine plastic funded project by the UK government. So that was quite cool. Yeah. How exactly true that is, I don't know. But that's what we were told at the time. Um, but it was a really, really small um, project, which was looking at how you could uh, take local waste be it fishing net and our our, um, uh, our example but you could use other stuff as well and then do sort of really quick small scale making prototypes like based on the precious plastics model mm -hmm. which was created by dave hackens is his uh, design academy eindhoven i think uh, master's project and he created a series of machinery that anybody could build for a small amount of money or relatively small amount of money mm -hmm. um and it's like a uh, an injection molder, um, a compression oven, a shredder. And the idea is that people could set up plastic recycling mini factories wherever they are. So instead of having to get huge amounts of plastic to make lots mm. of stuff, you could do small run production. So we use that as a basis for our injection molder we've got in the studio. Um, and we basically chop up the net, we feed it in, it melts it, we extrude it into a, like a sausage, and then we can put a mold onto the bottom, then put the pellets back in, remelt them, and then injection mold them into a mold. Um, and we were using cabinet handles as our test project. Okay, uh, I was just going to ask, what are you making? Yeah, yeah. so in theory, you can make anything that as long as you, cause you've got a maximum amount of pellets, you can yeah. get and melt. So that is what your limiting factor is. Mm -hmm. The bigger it is, the more force you need to pull it down. So the stronger <laughs> you need to be. Um, so it's quite good for the bicep workout. Um, <laughs> but we wanted to create a test product that because we were working directly with the fishers that we were taking the net from. It was the mm -hmm. Emma Louise trawler we were working with. 
Um, and we wanted to create something that we could sell to a retail market because you've got that story of it came from a fishing net. But we also wanted something that in theory the fishers could use themselves as well. So we thought about like handles of, um, of knives of some kind of some kind of tool. And eventually we decided to, on the uh, handles because if you think about it, a cabinet handle, unless you kick it off the cabinet, it should be there almost forever. Yeah. It's something that's utilitarian. So every time you touch it, you're reminded of that story. You're reminded of that material. Um, it doesn't degrade. Uh, you can clean it really easily. And literally the, the fishers could boot it around and it wouldn't break. But then equally, it could look really beautiful in a lovely high-end kitchen. And the way that the polypropylene changed when we ejection molded it is it went slightly marbly in green. So when we were showing it at Clerkenwell again, People were coming up going, oh, my God, is it like malachite or is it like jade or some kind of really yeah. semi-precious stone? It sounds beautiful. I'm imagining yeah. it. <laughs> and it looked and it was really we didn't know it was going to do that until yeah, we did it. This is why process and experimentation is so important. Mm. You never quite know what you're going to get to. Yeah. So, yeah, so that was the first thing that we did. So we might still be doing other stuff. We've got a couple of funding bids going at the moment to maybe do some other product lines. But, uh, but yeah, it, it's a lovely material. Yeah, absolutely. It's so good to hear about this. Um, I just want to encourage anybody who has got any questions. I'm trying to exhaust my questions, but uh, yeah, I can see something coming through. Um, um, no, it's super exciting to hear this because, again, uh, I don't, I'm not a huge fan of recycling um, fishing nets into fibers for textiles. Mm. And that's a whole other story. So it's lovely <laughs> to hear uh, the recycling into a, a hard materials, which, again, it's about longevity and durability. And they yeah. still can come back into the system. Um, anything else that you worked on uh, in terms of recycling materials or more of a kind of a circularity model that you invented or came across or sort of uh, embedded into your um, clients' projects that you can share with us? Oh, um, not really that we invented, but we always try and encourage uh, projects to be as um, disassemblable as possible. So this is one thing, where, particularly when you're doing interior spaces, is you can build something to fit that space. Great. Mm. But then if the needs of the client or the user change or somebody decides to move. And again, this is the same for, um, you know, interior spaces like domestic spaces. If you could take something to pieces, take it with you and amend it. So it changes to suit what you need. Amazing. Mm. And that's what we really try and encourage. So designing for disassembly, because if you can take it to bits, you can change yeah. it. And we did this with Hisby. This was something that we did. We built a lot of stuff out of scaffolding systems because it's quick, it's simple, it's easy, it's a pure material, it's easy to recycle, but it's easy to amend. And because as they were starting, it was like, not quite sure if this area is going to work. We might need to extend it. It might need to get smaller. Great. Let's configure it in such a way that it can be changed in six months' time. So it means that you're saving money mm. in the future future um so that is one thing we always try and embed in all of our projects as a methodology um yeah. so yeah we didn't invent it for sure but that's something that we definitely try and put in right from the very beginning how can you take the thing to bits yeah no absolutely i, I think it's finally time to really put this into education as well that how we need to think about the life cycle of a product and what happens to it at the end and again especially with an interior and and architecture that should be you know, one of the first things you address, you know, uh, how long can it last and what happens to it and how can we change it and work around it? Um, just want to come back to a question that I saw earlier. And also uh, it interests me that it's shocking to hear this, the amount of fishing nets that are at seas and, and oceans. And um, how can we prevent it? Actually, wh why does it? I mean, maybe it's a silly question, but um, I just don't know the answer myself. Like, how come it's left there? Can we not make people responsible taking them out or yeah well, how does this even happen it's it's so interesting and so complicated at the same time mm -hmm. so basically um mm -hmm. the first thing to think about is that fishing nets cost a lot of money like tens of thousands of pounds um so generally fishers don't want to to lose them because that's a hell of a lot of kits I mean, yeah. imagine if that was your business and you lose the thing to allow you to do your business. I'm vegetarian and I don't even eat fish. So my views on that is quite interesting. But <laughs> at the same time, it's like they would lose a lot of their kits. So generally people don't want to lose them. Yeah. So this is why we call it uh, abandoned, lost or otherwise discarded fishing gear. Generally things are lost. If they're lost, it's sometimes that uh, maybe another ship has gone over their lines and cut the lines and it gets lost. Maybe it's bad weather. Maybe it gets snagged on the bottom of the of the ocean um, or like on the bed. It could be snagged on a wreck. So there's lots of reasons why it could get lost. 
Hmm. Sometimes it's very hard to find it again. And we, there's been some trials uh, looking at how you can geolocate a net if it's lost. So net, if they get lost, particularly off, off our coast, you have to report them because it generally is a, it is a hazard. And if you think about hmm. a massive thing floating around that could get tangled around a propeller as well as the environmental yeah. Um, so generally they try to get retrieved as much as possible when you start to go into different areas and you talk about illegal fishing that's different because if an illegal fishing net is lost it probably won't be reported this is globally Um, and particularly if you go into the uh you know maybe into the more far east you go towards india south america you tend to find more illegal fishing happening And quite often, instead of getting caught, they'll grab the fish and then dump the net. So that's another whole practice that, you know, that's more of a policing practice we need to get into to figure out how that could be reduced. No, they can't be cost effective for them dumping the net. I mean, well, uh, some of the fine nets, some of the monofilament nets are literally pennies to buy. So the big, big, big nets that we have, the big trawl nets that um, I've got a bit somewhere. I've got a little bit of net somewhere. Um, It's like that sort of jady greeny sort of color that's the one we, we mm-hmm. get for trawls that are really strong but when you're talking about the monofilament that's really really fine they don't really cost a lot of money oh, they're it's manufactured it's at it's such it's a scale mm-hmm. particularly the relatively smaller ones that are for small fishing boats mm-hmm. um sometimes they just get dumped because it's just like well whatever it's gone. easier yeah cheaper, it's easier yeah. it's literally like a throwaway plastic mm-hmm. that is what it is it's a, it's a few use uh, and also because they weigh quite cheaply, they don't really last that long either. Mm-hmm. So instead of being repaired, it's not cost effective to repair them. So therefore, they just get dumped and then a new one gets bought. Um, sometimes they're dumped in the ocean. Sometimes they're brought into land and burnt, which is maybe even worse because then you've got the dioxin released from the plastic. So it becomes really, really complicated with the with the net itself. Mm-hmm. Um, but yeah, there's a huge amount of material that, that we could be recovering. Also with fishing nets, there hasn't really been an incentive to bring them back in. So all of the around all around the UK, you're responsible for the materials that you're bringing in. So it was costing the fishers 350, 400 pounds per ton, maybe just going up all the time to get rid of their nets. Now, you think how big a net is. That's a lot of money to then pay mm. out to get rid of something. So a lot of the fishers we work with were responsible and didn't dump it. But it just meant that it just sat there. So unless you can get it to a recycling place and there's only a few in the world that recycle fishing net, um, again, you've got the cost benefit balance. So when we did our project, we were saying, you know, we want to work out how much we can buy the fishing nets for you. And the fishers are like, please just take take it. it. (laughs) Give give us nothing. Give us, you know, a packet of biscuits. We we don't want anything for it. Just get rid because obviously they're saving money. They don't have to get rid of it. Yeah. Um, so, yeah, so that's what makes it really, really complicated. But if you can get it to the right recycling places, you can make really valuable recycle. It could then be turned yeah, into, into really exciting do we, stuff. Do we have one in UK for nope. fishing nets? No. Okay. No. I mean, there's some places that do some kind of recycling, but the biggest yeah. ones are generally um, on the continent. So there's one in Italy, uh, Slovakia, I think there was one as well. Um, and there is also one in Denmark, um, Denmark, Norway, sort of bridging over there. Um, mm-hmm. So, yeah, plastics, those are the guys we know really well who are also part of the Triple GI. So this is quite interesting that we've got a really good spread in the Triple GI between the people who are at the, you know, literally the hard end of doing the recycling themselves all the way through to the people who are using the gear um, on a large scale as well as a very small scale. Mm-hmm. So, uh, yeah, the actual recycling of net in the UK is something that is yet to happen at scale. Um, this project we were actually looking at for a little while ago, that's what our project was the feeder for, to figure out if you could make it profitable and what would be needed. Yeah. Um, yeah, David is just so. saying the same thing, yes. <laughs> <laughs> it's good to yeah. hear that. <laughs> you are yeah. <laughs> yeah, you know, David and I have been talking quite extensively about this for, for a few years, about how this could happen. But yeah, it's yeah. yet to come. But Things take time, of course. And yeah, we are, we are seeing some progress within this recycling and, and the sort of circularity or attempt for circularity around plastic. But we still have a way to go, I'm afraid. And, and just saying it from my perspective, from, again, fashion and textiles. Um, but I, I think it needs to be actually a conversation, an overlap between the different industries, how to best recycle plastic. And I'm a huge advocate for, you know, recycling into a more solid plastics rather than yeah. the ones who shed microfibers so that's yeah. a whole other story yeah oh my god microfibers yeah i had a really long conversation <laughs> something about that recently they were horrified they were like oh my god you know yeah, yeah. And, the, and the same applies you know it's such a complex question for textiles because it depends if it's filaments or the short fibers um and you know i just i heard a conversation live with econil the other day and um 
you know, it's a great company and obviously a great um, recycling system and model, business model. But, you know, his answer was, oh, it definitely doesn't shed microfibers. Trust me. <laughs> and I was like, I like to see facts. I'm yeah. not sure if I can trust Where's one person like telling me that. Yeah. So, yeah. yeah. And he's, um, a, he's a very passionate speaker as well. So I've seen, I've seen the founder talk at a few things and he's very, very passionate about his stuff. And yeah, they were one of the first people to do, do that sort of kind of recycling. But yeah, show us the data. That's what we want to see. <laughs> yes. Um, but speaking of plastic, so uh, it's unavoidable. It's all around us. We are drowning in plastic. And as you said yourself, it, it's, it is a great material. It's just we haven't been using it well or, or rather we forgot that it doesn't go away. So we finally starting to see it um, and trying to deal with this. Um, now we are in July. It's Plastic yep. Free July, uh, which is a campaign that's been going on for a few years, I believe. Um, yeah. And uh, can you tell us more about it? Because I know you are quite vocal on your social media about this. And it's great because I think people really want to hear what can we do better? You know, how can we replace plastic? So can you just give us some advice and, and your uh, sort of encounter with this campaign? Sure. So yeah, Plastic Free July, exactly what the name says. So it's Plastic Free for July. So very much like Veganuary, you pledge to go vegan in January. Hopefully you will carry that on or shift the way you, you, you eat. Um, plastic Free July is to try and encourage people to go plastic free for one month. Um, so yes, yeah, so the campaign is amazing. It gets spread all over the world. You could use the hashtag um, Plastic Free July if you're doing something. Um, and I've got sort of two social media channels that I've been using to sort of promote this. So we also run in the studio a campaign called Plastic Free Pledge, which is an international campaign that was around helping people switch from back in the beginning. It was plastic straws through to something more, you know, a different alternative. But we've got ambassadors around the UK, around the world, actually, that are doing, you know, helping to communicate the message um, around single use plastic. So on Plastic Free Pledge Instagram, I'm doing quick, simple changes that, you know, the reusable tote bag, the reusable produce bags. So things that people see far more now and it's easy to do. But then I also I've got on um, uh, the, the uh, Instagram that I have, also here's a Claire Potter design. I'm sort of rephrasing it a little bit. So Plastic Free July and the circular economy. So how do these things sit together? How do they work really well together how are they maybe in conflict and this is a really interesting conversation so you can think about uh changing a single-use plastic bag to maybe going to a refill store and using a paper bag so if you say to people that's the switch people go brilliant because i can recycle my plastic bag uh, paper bag rather but then you look at the carbon footprint of a paper bag and against a single-use plastic bag and a single-use paper bag paper bag is probably about three times the amount of carbon footprint as a single-use plastic bag so, yes, we can recycle it at end of life, but if we're only using it once, we're creating triple the amount of carbon, which is the thing that ultimately we need to be reducing. Yep. This is where it gets completely mind-blowing and really complicated. And everything that we, um, that we do, we should ultimately be thinking about what the carbon footprint is of this. And this is where circular economy comes in really lovely. Mm -hmm. So, yeah, use the paper bag, but use it more than three times. Use it for storage. Use it for something else. Use it for a craft project. Um, line your rabbits you know bedding with it and then stick it in the compost so there's lots of other things you could do instead of a single use to single use and things like plastic wrap of a cucumber so you'd say to people is that a good thing and go well yeah it's not a good thing it's single use plastic but then that cucumber wrap might last an extra two to three weeks so if it means you're reducing food waste, which then rots, which then creates methane, and methane is 23 times worse than carbon. Yeah. So then the, again, you're like, oh, ultimately we should buy a smaller cucumber that's local, organic. We should eat the whole bloody thing. But yeah, food waste, <laughs> number one. <yeah. laughs> so this is where it's really interesting to sort of get that correlation between being plastic free, mm. then also discussing where plastic sometimes is an okay option and yeah. we shouldn't guilt ourselves. And then also how sometimes that conversation is really difficult and those decisions are really difficult because we're not being allowed to have a different choice because of our economic uh, standing. If you can go and buy three plastic peppers and it costs you half the amount of price of buying three loose peppers and you're on a budget, should we be shaming that person and saying, yeah. no, buy the loose ones if they turn and say, I can't afford to. So this is where we should be pushing back at the supermarkets and the suppliers and saying, you're not giving us an option. And yeah. it shouldn't just be this middle class waitrose shopper 
exclusive Western, you know, conversation. It should be wider. Um, and we shouldn't feel that anybody's being excluded from that conversation. So I love Plastic Free July and it allows me to sort of push the buttons and then, uh, you know, try and increase people's awareness of the difficulties. No, absolutely. And also, I mean, there's a question that you pretty much answered in, in some way that should you should using less plastic be driven by industry? And again, it's a complicated question, as you're explaining now, because um, not all plastic is bad. Sometimes we need it and it's just not black and white simply. Yeah. But uh, I agree that, you know, there's a huge problem with, you know, the system that we created, the supermarket system that they have in place, that it's cheaper, things are wrapped in plastic. And how do we transition and, you know, how do we create more pressure uh, on, on what? On the supermarket or on the government? Us as consumers, I mean, uh, absolutely, it goes down to waste and our consumption. We should think about what we consume and how much. And I mean, I was always shocked when I saw the data of actually food waste. That It's just so alarming for London, for example. Um, and I thought it was clothes, actually. Uh, and no, it's the food. Um, so I think it's really important to have this conversation about that. Um, what does it really mean, plastic free, and how does it really sit and on the like within the space of what we need? Because plastic is not going to go away, yeah, uh, one yeah. way or another. But how do we deal with it? And again, comparing with the other materials that we have around, that we just assume they are better, not always mm. they are, like, yeah. like the paper bag. And that's really true. So, so the, the question about, you know, should it be driven by industry? I think this is part of, of the um, of the solution, because mm -hmm. if we give it an option and it's clearly communi communicated to us why it's like that. So, for example, uh, if you have a drink in a plastic bottle versus a drink in a glass bottle, glass weighs a hell of a lot more mm -hmm. than the plastic. So if it's got something that's being transported a really, really long distance, you've got the extra weight, which means extra emissions, which means extra carbon. Yeah. But then if you're getting a glass bottle and you're refilling it from your local store and you're using it again and again and again, and you're you know riding your bike to that refill store, then maybe glass is a good option. And also plastic, we've got all those tiny microplastics that are leaching out into our foods, particularly if they're oil based. So things like milk, you get quite a lot of leachate that comes out of the plastic. So is it better that we have um, glass milk bottles? So yes. this is what it's really, really complicated and makes it really interesting. But you can understand that a consumer going to a supermarket going, I'm just really confused now. What yes. is the right choice? You're now telling me that I shouldn't use paper bags. I mean, we can't we can't shut down the conversation we should be trying to figure out says, i mean we just we just like convenience and you know easy easiness and easy answers but i'm hoping that this current crisis and the lockdown they kind of gave us time to think about stuff you know how we shop how we use things and clearly within the circular economy that we just need different mechanisms for different reasons and different products as you say like you know sometimes plastic is really helpful because it transforms something or you know um, takes away some of the other issues that it creates etc um, so it's really about having this conversation and I just saw a question a really uh, interesting question how do you think we make plastic free July more inclusive mm. as you said with cost being higher for plastic free items yeah I think that's that's, yeah. that's a real big question. What do you it think? It really is. So uh, there's a brilliant, so we've got, uh, I, I, I love a refill store. And what was interesting, when we did the refill pods at Hisby, oh man, way back when, when they first opened, years and years ago, six years ago, seven years ago, um, they had all of the, like, the bins for, like, the uh, the loose fill stuff. Now, I remember going to the loose fill places with my nan when I was a kid, and she'd, like, get a scoop of broken biscuits, get a scoop of raisins, and then they were, they were putting plastic bags in, but then they went to the till and then they were weighed. I didn't see any of that for years. And then when Hisby said, we want to have these bins that people can get as many oats as they want or chocolate buttons as they want. And I was like, I really hope this works, but I don't think people are going to get it because it's that long since we've done it. But do you know what? Let's give it a go. And it was brilliant. There's so many people got on board and wanted to bring it, wanted to bring their own packages. And now we've seen this explosion of zero waste, zero packaging stores. Um, but what's really interesting about them is that if you're doing things by weight, quite often the weight is cheaper per 100 grams than even getting a packaged version in, in Brighton. Mm -hmm. And um, our, one of our local refill stores in, in um, Hove called Harrods of Hove did a fantastic post the other day that compared their, their packaging free lentils, chickpeas, etc., with Tesco's and with Sainsbury's. So not with the really like the lower end supermarkets like the Aldi's and Lidl's, but sort of the middle range. Yeah. Sainsbury's I know is a bit more expensive, but they compared it and some things they were way cheaper on. 
some things they were about the same so this is what we need to try and communicate to people is that yeah it's a different way of shopping mm -hmm. but you generally get a much nicer experience of the shopping and you only have to buy what you need which means you're also eliminating food waste you're not buying a massive packet of something that you know i think the status uh, statistic is that about a third of all of the stuff we buy yeah. goes straight in the bin so that's money yeah. that's money in the bin <laughs> It's not only food waste, it's money in the bin. And that's what we need to try and explain to people is buy less, use it all, get it from a refill store if you can. And you probably will, will save money across a multitude of different ways. So, and money is the thing that most people are really concerned about, particularly now with, um, with all the COVID complexities. Uh, and it was great to see the refill stores being really well supported um, during mm -hmm. the, sort of the lockdown because they were essential stores, but also they didn't have to deal with packaging. And a lot yeah, of our supply right. chain issues, it wasn't the fact we didn't have any flour. We had plenty of flour, people, <laughs> in the UK. We had plenty. But we didn't have the ability to package it into small packets to allow it to go on a supermarket shelf. So a refill store could just get a bulk bag, put it into a bin, and then you could scoop it out yourself. So it was the packaging supply chain. It wasn't necessarily the product. So this is where it is. Again, people were yeah. like, and I went to the refill store in Brighton, and a guy came in who'd never been into one before. And he's like, oh, my God, there's pasta, and there's flour. And, there's, and literally, he was like, mind blown. Um, it's it just you, know, you can buy it in another way. I'm yeah. It was, so I really hope that people can engage in that way. Yeah, no, this is a great advice to, to finish on, I suppose, and uh, just really explore the different ways how we can shop and just to be more mindful, I'd say, you know, and in terms of, you know, how we buy things and, and what do we expect, um, them, the materials that we buy as well. Mm. And um, uh, David is asking if you finish your boat. <laughs> <laughs> no, I haven't finished my boat yet. So that is my long term project. I've got a, a 35 foot gentleman's cruiser I'm converting into a houseboat. Wow. So yeah, Dora Bella, she's my darling. Um, but because of lockdown, the boatyard was shut. So yeah. I haven't been able to work on her. Um, but and I've also been writing a book over the last, over lockdown. So that's just been finished. Yesterday was my deadline day. Amazing. So, Congratulations. Thank you. <laughs> Achievement so, yeah. of the lockdown. Brilliant. Yeah. Yeah. I literally, I signed the contract just as lockdown started and I finished it um, about a week ago. So the last bits went across to the editor. So long way to go yet, but it's all around explaining the circular economy to everyday people. So Amazing. it doesn't matter if you've never heard the term before. You, you, you know, Rita, you know, um, uh, repairing, you know, reusing you know all these things that fit into a circular economy so that's what the book is going to do is to try and help people navigate this unseemingly impenetrable term and when is it going to be out thing. probably around june next year so it's been okay. published in the uk and the us simultaneously um and then we'll keep an eye on that it. for sure and yeah, promote it fast. Brilliant. Yeah. <laughs> no, uh, that's that's a great information to have something to look forward to congratulations and Thank you. uh and, uh, and just reading that you're getting a lot of love on the on your comments and on your posts, and also it's um, there are some lovely people who are using the refill as well. So that's good to hear. Brilliant. Brilliant. Oh, one last thing that I'll just yes. quickly say with regards to the refill. So there's a new system that's just started. It started in the US called Loop, and basically it's refillable containers. But they instead of it just being a brandless, um, they actually link up with with um, things like Hagen Dars and Gillette. So they're big brands. Some Sometimes people don't like refill because they don't know what they're getting. Mm -hmm. So this is a new system that's just come to the UK. It's just been trialed with Tesco. And the idea is you get all of your packaging. It's reusable packaging. You use your ice cream. You put it back into your container. It gets picked up, sent back to the, de the depot, refilled with stuff. And then it just gets, it gets circulates around. Amazing. So if people are more interested in doing something like that through a supermarket setting because it feels what, what they're comfortable with, then that's also worth looking at. So watch this space to see how Loop is going to progress as well. Lou, thank you for the tip. We'll look into it. It's been a pleasure. Thank you for staying with us for uh, all this time. I yep, thank you, everyone. I've seen a, seen a few and, people uh, know, so hey, guys. <laughs> uh, so um, I don't know who is lined up for next week, I'm afraid, but we do have a speaker on um, uh, Plastic Free July. Um, so we'll keep you posted. Uh, watch out our social media. Thank you, Claire, and uh, hopefully see you soon in the real life or virtual one. <laughs> that sounds great. Thank you so much for having Thank me. You. Thank, Thank you. It's a pleasure. Bye. Bye for now. Take and care. Bye-bye. Bye-bye.